the same one, obviously, but similar to it, exists in every major urban area in the, in the state. Uh, there are, you know, 2,000 teachers in the Indiana Science Initiative, for example, doing this sort of work. Other cities are doing, are, are all doing the same thing. So the, what we find is that where it's not happening is in the rural areas. It's very hard to address small school districts. The big school districts are all on board and doing it very well. The kids love it. It's exactly what you're saying. I've been showing the same kind of pictures for years. How can you address using your strategies, how can you address the rural districts? Well, a couple of things. I mean, when you look at the, our, our schools today, and we're 5,000 schools. Thank you. It's really not a rural school issue. It's a small school issue. Okay. It's a very small school issue, which exists in a lot of places. And one of the primary issues that we have is the teacher training piece. Uh, schools make a decision. I mean, take, take a small school. Take a school of 50 kids. We, have, we actually have PLW school for 30 students in the entire school. They're offering something. They're offering courses. They're providing an educational experience for the students. The challenge is they have a difficult time offering many electives because of the small population. So they just have to decide what they're going to offer and they want to offer something that they believe works and will provide the, out the outcomes they want for their students. But the other issue that we have faced as an organization is teacher training and making sure it's the same issue that a lot of small school, particularly rural school, this is a rural school issue, is access to great teachers. And teachers that want to move into rural areas and you know, when we think of Indiana, Indiana is not rural. If you want rural, I can show you some other states that are rural, right? and where literally you have to go three hours to find a stoplight. And we don't have that same issue here. Most of our rural schools are within, you know, our hour drive into metropolitan areas or larger MSAs. So what we're doing with the teacher training, and that's what we're doing here, it's a very different model for us. Historically, we have, all of our teachers have gone to university campuses to train. We're going to do all the training here. So all of our schools within the region have easy access, and then we're also looking how to retrain. So let me give you one other example on the teacher training, why it can be an issue. And why we encourage schools to have more than one teacher trained for a particular course or for multiple courses. So you have, you heard some of the examples in the panel talking about having students signed up for all the courses. If you have one teacher teaching all the courses and that teacher is no longer there, you have students signed up for all the courses. No teacher. That, that can be a challenge. So we encourage schools to try to find more than one teacher to teach this series of courses. So we're really trying to address the, we have a major initiative we're working on right now that doesn't affect this particular project role, but we also have across America nearly three million children being homeschooled. And most of our schools in the nation are rural schools. Most um, don't have access to some of these the things we're talking about. So we're trying to address that issue. Here we're bringing everything here so that we can address the, all the needs of schools. Hope that answered your question. Thank you. Please go ahead and begin your question and we'll get your mic. I am from a rural school. I am the only biology teacher, and there are three science teachers in our department. So I'm doing the biomedical instruction first class this year. I am the only teacher. If I go someplace else, the program is gone. We don't have the money to pay to have more than one teacher to be to have the training to be able to teach the class. Well, you're going you're going to train for each course. Right. So whether it's one teacher, two teachers, or three teachers, it doesn't change the cost. But we don't have the staffing to, to have four teachers. Well. Yeah, it, it, it is true. <coughs> yeah, I, I understand that. It's true, really, in any discipline. It's well, I think true. it's true in any rural school, and I would argue that I am I am in a rural school, and there are quite a few in northern Indiana. Sure. No, I, I understand that. I'm just saying that that is a challenge in any discipline. Not just in Project Rewind. 
I agree. Right? It, it's, it, it's access to teachers. So what we're trying to do, again, is bring the training here so that we can make that more accessible to all schools and to make training at a lower cost. And that's what the grants will be part of. They help cover. So the grants will be part of the grant, the grant process. It's going to help cover costs to train the teachers? For all new schools, that is correct. New schools that are coming on, part of the grant will cover the teacher training costs. Thank you. I, I think one, one uh, important fact when you look at our region here is we have uh, three of the five counties are rural. And the community engagement is really what we saw come together. When you uh, had folks out raising that funds to help support this effort all across the region, you're seeing businesses come to the table for the first time. Uh, governments made contributions in certain counties. Uh, you know, philanthropic uh, uh, donors came together. I think really our job and part of this initiative is to raise the awareness of the needs so we can tackle those issues and bring those on the forefront of those policymakers. And, and that's really what this is about, uh, overcoming those initial costs, dialing in what are those needs there, because we really saw the community step up to the need that they identified. And so this is a process for us to keep evolving and moving forward to get closer and closer to solving the need that that school has. I'm curious about the grant. I teach at New Prairie High School. We've had a Project Lead the Way courses in biomedical and engineering for some time. I don't know how long. It's been at least, oh gosh, at least eight years at this point, I think. And um, I'm curious about what effect the grant will have on schools like us who have a very well operating program already. <coughs> Well, the, the funding for this initiative is really uh, for new programs. That's the, the that's the first step for the programs. I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch. Which school were you from? New Prairie High School. New Prairie, which is in St. Joseph County, correct? It's, it's in so the building is physically in McCourt County, but the service is in Lowe County. Okay, um, so that's kind of one of those issues we may have to work through on that side. But uh, in many of the areas, uh, you know the funds were raised to help address other, that could be available to address other issues like existing ongoing programs. Um, but the, the announcement today and the first funds that were raised are geared toward bringing new programs online. But you know, we cover middle school, elementary. And, yeah, so if you have a high school program and, 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 you, want, and you have gateway for middle school and you want to add the elementary program, the elementary grant accessible to you. And this grant is for the entire, the money that has been raised, and this is something I'm not sure we've covered yet, but we, it was a matching grant with PLTW and your communities. And we, when we started this, we wanted to raise enough money to allow all schools in the region, both private and public, elementary, middle, and high schools, to have access to the grant. So the school applies for the grant, and there's a readiness part of this, and the grant is available to those schools. So in a school district that only has a middle school program that wants the high school or the elementary, you can apply for grants for those programs. So it's really program based. What about the computer science? We don't have a computer science program yet. Yeah, so here's what we're doing with computer science. There's such a, a substantial need across the, in the state and the country for computer science. So our first course is, will be introduced in the engineering pathway. So schools can actually pick up that. Really, so if you already have the high school engineering program, we can have our first course in computer science as part of the engineering pathway. Then the, other, the full pathway is in development. And we'll roll out over the next four years. And that's why now at this point, part the new path, the computer science pathway is not part of this program. It's just not there yet. It's not available. But, but what it is, it is a part of the opportunity. John? Um, you mentioned having 5,000 schools. I was curious about what percentage of students in those schools are able to do or like their goal there. Um, yeah, right now we have over 600,000 students in our program, and that's growing substantially every year. One of the things that we did as an organization, and I, and I don't want spent too much time on this, but there were a number of things when we started about two and a half years ago that we thought were barriers to growth and access. I'll give you one. And some of you that already have PLW understand this. 
we had software packages that we would provide schools. It had limitations on the number of seats. So for instance, in one suite of Autodesk software for our IED courses, when the schools had to purchase each year, you had to buy a software package that had a, a seat limit of 125 students. So we had schools that would make decisions based on how many students to enroll, they would cap it at 125 so they would have to buy another license. Or they would decide not to offer a particular course because the software cost the course. All of that changed a year ago. And now we, we provide as a participation fee for schools, which is less than one site license for Autodesk, we include all required software for all courses, unlimited seats. There was a huge savings for schools. And it was a major initiative for us that we rolled out just this year. So that's what we're trying to do. So we looked at some of those gaps. Great question. Others? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Go ahead and begin. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dane Long. I'm the director of the History of Science Society based here at Notre Dame. I was at the American Association for Advancement of Science meeting last month in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of discussion of STEAM. And so this might be a question for Ms. Antonelli. Well, the idea of introducing arts into the STEM programs, and I was wondering if there are any plans for that. Well, I think the one thing that we really want to take into account is the fact that we don't view any content as being independent anymore. And the fact that one of the major challenges is how to build creative thinking and how to make our students rise to that level of thought and that kind of process and problem solving. And so part of what we're really uh, working with is looking at the integration of many different areas into problem solving and problem-based learning so that students are researching, they're seeing the overlap of all kinds of things. Because how can we, for example, if an individual is building um, a new kind of joint for a hip replacement, how can that transpire without the creative thinking that also takes into account um, the fundamental design, not only how it has to work, but how it has to function, how it has to look, how it has to interface. And so part of what we are doing at Penn Harris Madison is really working strongly at integrating content areas across. For example, there's something, and we haven't used this term today, but it's called a performance task. And a performance task is when, not just an assessment, you know, if you're, you're asking a student a question and all you want is an answer. You know, that's a depth of knowledge of one. But if you're asking the student to integrate knowledge and to be able to apply it and think, of different ways that it can be associated or whatnot. Those are depth of knowledge levels three and four. And so what we're doing is we're working with our teachers, with our faculty. They, oh my gosh, there's nothing better than sitting with a great group of, of teachers who, who think so well and think so well together and creating something called a performance task where a student has to have cold reads and think about math and think about the science implications and think about the reading that integrates and the arts that integrate in, able, in order to be able to solve that. So in a roundabout way to your answer, I think it's absolutely essential that the arts, the visual arts, the performing arts, that that kind of thinking is integrated because I truly believe that that's also how we get to the creative thinking that we have to, to help our students be able to do. Thank you. You'll find the arts specifically in other disciplines that are embedded in everything we do in all of our courses. Look at the launch program for elementary children and so much around creativity and the arts and the design process and architecture. And students just you know study what they produce it and the creativity. I can't imagine having an engineer that's not creative. You know, I mean we we need creative people. And I would argue that that is what truly has distinguished our country in many respects, is our ability to innovate and so As an example, uh, the kindergartners design a paintbrush. So they're studying artists, they're studying history, how to use a paintbrush, how to design a paintbrush.
and, and you know, and the, it's the, the design process, you know, how do you get the paint from the paint pot to the, and they're, you know, drawing with it and how does it work and then redesigning. So that's, you know, just a, a specific example of that. Well, our questioning need not come to an end, but it's going to pause for a little bit now. Uh, let's thank very much our responders uh, to, uh, to our next session. And I'd like to, uh, to ask uh, Mr. Tim Sexton uh, to introduce it. Uh, Tim is the uh, Associate Vice President uh, at the University of, Na of Notre Dame for Public Affairs. Thank you, Thomas. Welcome this morning. Hope everybody's doing well. I have the responsibility of introducing, introducing three speakers today, uh, one from Elkhart County, Kosciuszko County, and St. Joe County. I'm excited to do that. Prior to that, though, I just want to again just thank Vince, Rex, and the and the uh, Project Leadway team for being here today. And I know for us, uh, speak for all of us, we say we hope you have safe travels back south. All right? Thank you. The first speaker we have today is, is Brian Weeby. Brian has worked as an educator for 25 years in early childhood, middle school, high school, and higher education as a teacher and an administrator, serving for 10 years as executive director of the Goshen College Music Center. Prior to his leadership role at Goshen College, he taught at C Central Christian School in Kedron, Ohio and at Bethel College in North Newton, Kansas. At the Music Center, he was responsible for all outreach community programming that grew out of the center's first decade, overseeing operations and fundraising as well. He played a significant role in Elkhart County's strategic planning process beginning in 2010 that led to the creation of the Horizon Education Alliance in 2012. He became the Horizon Education Alliance's first executive director in October of 2012. He has a master's degree from Northwestern University and is currently pursuing a master's in arts and intercultural leadership from Goshen College. Please join me in welcoming Brian Weeby. Thank you very much. Thank you to uh, Tim for the introduction and thank you to Dr. Tom Logren uh, running the PowerPoint for us this morning but really convening all this. Uh, great appreciation to him and to Notre Dame for um, the, the work that they do, leadership in our uh, county and certainly region. Um, thanks also to, um, to Dr. Bertram and uh, really Sean Peterson for helping make this happen for our region, uh, Sean's role out of CPEG, Corporate Partnership for Economic Growth. I know this next section is going to talk about um, uh, business and education really. So uh, it's a very exciting day I think for our region. So I want to do uh, four quick things with you, and the fourth one is to have a, a short question and answer time. So I'll try to get through the first three fairly quickly. The first one, I want to tell you about the vision that's in Elkhart County, one county to the east. I want to tell you about how this happened, a, a, a brief history, cover 40 years really fast, um, and, and then talk about um, the life of a young child that's born on March 1, 2014. Uh, sometime today and talk a little bit about the story that's going to uh, go forward. First of all, the vision. Elkhart County will be a world-class place to live and learn and work and play. That's a big vision because while there are world-class elements in Elkhart County, Elkhart County is not currently a world-class place to live and learn and work and play. Elkhart County has low educational attainment about 10 points behind Indiana, and Indiana is about five points behind the rest of the nation, and our nation trails some countries by 21 percentage points. We have low per capita income. That creates all kinds of other things that we don't like in our community. In 1970, this was not the case. Um, uh, we had per capita income was pretty much leading the nation. We had pretty good business diversification. One business left that was pretty key to our community, Miles Laboratory, Alka-Seltzer Tablets. They moved, a few others moved, and we've become very focused on one industry, manufacturing, light manufacturing more than advanced manufacturing. 2008 and 9 were not good to us. Our unemployment rate went from 4% to 19%. Uh, the President of the United States visited twice in 2009. His first visit out of the Beltway, he had maybe gone to a hamburger joint in D.C., but he had never left the Beltway, and he came to Elkhart County. And our leaders said, that's the last time 
that a president of the United States is going to come to Elkhart County for the wrong reasons. 2009, they pulled together. Four years ago, first conversations, education was showing up all over, a half-day conversation where 200 local leaders came together. Uh, really, it's four and a half years old, that conversation was. Um, this board formed two years ago. It is every superintendent in the seven school systems of Elkhart County. It is business CEOs of companies that range from Amish Shaw's Chemcrest company of 150 million to Rex Martin's company of Nibco, which is way more than that. I don't know. I think it's a billion. It's, it's a lot. Um, other um, entrepreneurs, Ron Fennick there, who's with Grand Design, the newest RV company. So RV is represented. There's an IT company CEO. And then there are um, a few not-for-profit leaders as well. Linda Yoder, who is here from Marshall County, who helped make this whole deal happen. She's a long-time Elkhart County native, so she would be part of it, a few other Elkhart County leaders. And this group has made it happen, and it's a bold vision. I happen to think it's the boldest educational vision in the country, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Maybe true, maybe not. But we travel a lot. We talk to a lot of people. It's pretty bold. The people who have created it, uh, some are in the room. We have a superintendent, Jim Du Bois from Bago Schools is here. Um, there are other uh, education leaders, teachers, and really everyone has built this plan. It's a big, thick plan that is happening as we speak. And I would just ask the Elkhart County people in the room to stand up just so we see where you are. Just stand up. I know there are some here. There might be a half dozen. There might be. Susan, are you from Elkhart County? Yes, okay. So teachers, thank you very much. So this is this, and, and this is kind of what we're pursuing. Um, we hired, we, uh, staffing is about 18 months old, and what I'm going to tell you, the story that I'm going to tell you now, is while it is fictitious, it's not far-fetched. Most of these things are now happening. Things are already going. So I'm going to tell you about the, the uh, little boy named Arthur, who's born on March 1, 2014, at Elkhart General. He's either already been born this morning or he'll be born this afternoon. I don't have the specifics down, um, but he's going to be born today. And uh, June 1 comes along in Elkhart County, June 1, 2014, and uh, believe it or not, uh, warm weather has come. And Arthur <laughs> is in these little tights, and his mother is super proud of his fat thighs. And so this is this little baby, and he walks into a room, and there are 10 other little babies there, mostly with their mothers, a couple fathers. And um, they, they're there, and what Arthur experiences is that he hears all these sounds, organized sound, he doesn't use those words because he doesn't use words yet, but he hears these sounds and it's a music together class. It's appropriate that this would happen because Elkhart County is kind of the, one of the music capitals of the world to the extent that band instrument manufacturing, that's where it all began. The only manufacturing company that still does instruments, Con Selmer, is still there, hanging on. They adopted lean practices and they're actually doing quite well. You also have the singing Mennonites over there. It's quite a singing community. Sometimes, eh, there's just a lot of, lot of singers over there. So it's appropriate. And they go, and this little Arthur hears all these sounds, organized sounds. They're lullabies. They're silly songs. They're folk songs. And then the next thing, he's wrapped up in his mother's arm, and they're dancing around the room with all the other ten little babies. And his vestibular system, which is responsible for, for balance, is going nuts. He just loves this. He experiences this at home because there's a CD that goes home with them, and he comes back the next week, and they do this eight times. And not only is music being taught, this first language, his first language of hopefully a trilingual child someday, but he's also uh, benefiting from the parenting messages that his mother is getting. Three years later, uh, some of the children in that class, uh, they, they are all uh, walking down the same aisle in the Meyer store on 33 there in Elkhart. And, and two of them come from this way, two from this way. And this big greeting from the parents, because they were all in that music together class, together, back in 2014. Well, now we're in 2017. And it was quite a great conversation among the parents. But the really cool thing was that the four little children, who were now three, they didn't remember each other, but they interacted a little bit. Um, the, the cool thing was they didn't tear things off the shelves. I mean, this was a four-minute conversation from the parents excited to see each other. And they weren't, they weren't pulling at their mother's uh, you know, skirt and saying, can we go, mommy? It wasn't that. They had a pretty good sense of um, self-control, you might say. And it came from this parenting system that was implemented in 2014 in Elkhart County, all across the county, all partners, called Positive Parenting Program, Triple P, Evidence-Based Practice which all of Elkhart County's programs were, out of Australia, in 
uh, 25 countries around the world. It was back in 2014. And parents get the help they need to help set boundaries for child, children, be encouraging, read to them, help prepare them for kindergarten. Triple P, uh, very significant part of Arthur's little life. Well, a year later, Arthur was in not just preschool, but high quality preschool. A research effort in 2014 had said, yeah, Reggio Emilia is good, Montessori is great, uh, we've got high scope, and there's this also program that we're going to put a bunch of these in place. And Arthur happened to get in the, the program that was Tools of the Mind. Tools of the Mind was very Vygotskyan. Vygotsky, who was born 1896, only lived 38 years. So he was born the same year Piaget was, but he died at age 38. Piaget keeps living. Vygotsky's ideas stay in the Iron Curtain. Soviet Union doesn't like Vygotskyan ideas, really. But when you hear the word scaffolding today or read it on Project Lead the Way's website, that's Vygotskyan. Zone of proximal development, play, strategic play. Arthur had that. It was part of his imagination. Tools of the mind grew up in the, in the 90s. One of these social innovations that Elkhart County was all over leading the way. And Tools of the Mind and Montessori and all these others had a lot of children ready for kindergarten. Uh, there was, a, there was uh, you know, self-regulation was one of Vygotsky and things too, but, but uh, there was another thing. Elkhart County said, we want to make sure we get this right because self-regulation is huge. It's really important. If we want children ready to learn, so we're going to do the PACS Good Behavior Game. Again, 40 years of research. Grew up out of Kansas. You play this game, you're team A, you're team B, you're team 3. Okay, we're going to write our letters now for the next five minutes, first grade classroom. And remember, we don't want spleen. Spleen is a made up name. It's a misbehavior. Tipping on your chair, throwing your pencil, bugging the person next to you. Team 1, that's a spleen. Now, I don't call Joe's name here. I don't call him out on it. But he knows that there was a little misbehavior. Team 1, that's a spleen. Keep working on your letters. Team 3, be careful, don't tip on your chair. At the end of the game, five minutes. Team one, that was five spleams. Remember, you won under three. Team two, team three, you did it. You had less than three. You get to stand up, hop around your desk on one foot. <laughs> and first graders like that. First graders like that. Well, you take this out two years, fewer trips to the principal's office. Five years, less special education. Uh, Ten years, drug and alcohol use down. It goes all the way to incarceration rates because they've studied it for 40 years. Randomized controlled trial studies, implementing, it was already in place by the time Arthur got there. It was going by 2014, but it was really going by 2019. STEM plus the arts is a nice k made comment here. Very nice segue. I'm just going to leave this because I want to come back to that because it's a big chunk. Usually this is a big piece of the story that Arthur was in a STEAM environment. By this year, the whole Michiana region was all over STEAM. Well, I don't know. But okay, so could happen. I'm going to come back to that. There was an early college high school initiative. As, as it was with a lot of Elkhart County's programs, it wasn't, it wasn't that no one else was doing this. There were 250 early college high schools in the country by then. But there was no county that was pursuing all of it, all at once. All eight area county high schools making it happen. First county in the country to put early college high school in there, which was first generation college students, low income, poverty students, getting a two year degree by the time they're 18 because rigor was high starting in eighth grade. There were other things. Arthur was glad to live in a community. It's the year 2034 now. He's got his two-year associate degree. He's uh, working in a job, lean manufacturing company. But he can keep learning because uh, Horizon had worked with Ivy Tech to really make sure stackable curriculum was happening. They had put in place a lifelong learning literacies with leaders from the community. Already in 2014, there were 110 volunteer leaders doing something like CEOs of companies and president of the hospital and the president of the seminary leading ethical literacy. Ecological literacy is the last one. Ethical literacy, previous one. Uh, let me start from the beginning. Financial literacy, upper left. Health literacy, technological. How do we use these tools that help us? Arts literacy, intercultural literacy, ethical and ecological literacy. That's it, but I want to go back to STEAM and just say a word about this. So a STEAM environment, here's how we view it. We've worked closely with uh, Project Lead the Way leaders and Dr. Bertram and the others, Sean Cosgrove, have been very flexible with us. We're taking a little bit extra time to roll out you Elkhart County people in the room. By next fall, we're gonna be having, well, we're gonna have conversations now, but we have a very rich environment for STEAM, we think. And, and so it's, it's, it's three things I wanna tell you about. You've heard a lot about Project Lead the Way and that offer. We also have a, um, a treasure that, that is called Ethos, 
How many know of Ethos, encouraging technology and hands-on science? Susan Dish is assistant executive director of that, and it's a treasure. Out of, if you say Sputnik in 58 was huge, it prompted some reform and, and at the national level went to the moon, but other things too. Uh, uh, 1983, uh, Nation at Risk, that was big. The things that grew out of the 1980s, and Ethos was one of those, not really, it was grew out of Miles' lab a decade later, but, but, but in the 80s was when the Smithsonian and National Science Foundation said, we need to really improve science. They start a laser model, which is leadership and assistance for science education reform. How many know laser? Ethos leads this, and the, the CEO of, of uh, Smithsonian Science Education is coming in about a week. And, and that model, it, it does inquiry science, and really well, so we have that in summer schools. There, there are all kinds of implications for how that rolls out. Maybe that will dovetail, maybe sometimes we'll have one school doing that. It, we don't know exactly how it's going to work. And one other one that we're keen on is something called expeditionary learning. It grew out of that same decade. And then in 93, it was launched. Expedition Learning, anyone heard of it? It is outward bound, married with Harvard Graduate School of Education in the 90s. Hun only 150 schools. But we're launching one of those um, at, at a, an F school uh, 18 months from now, uh, a school in, in Goshen. And you, you want to see project-based learning across the whole school every minute of the day. It's unbelievable. So we're pursuing these three models, thinking about how STEM and STEAM works. Last comment I'd make is we kind of consider our patriarchs of STEAM. We, we, we wrestled with this concept about two and a half years ago. And we consider our patriarchs Leonardo da Vinci, whose death we'll celebrate five years from now, 2019. Leonardo da Vinci, how many knew he was an artist? Okay, everyone's hands goes up. How many knew he was an, a scientist and an inventor and all those things? How about a second patriarch of Benjamin Franklin? How many knew he was an inventor? Of course. How many knew he played the violin, the harp, and did the glass harmonica? Third one, how about Albert Einstein? How many knew that his favorite companion was his violin? And mathematical formulas happened when he improvised there. And he said, I'm smart because I played the violin. Those are three pretty nice patriarchs. How about the last one of Steve Jobs? Who, I don't think he was a musician, but he really hired some smart people. And he said, who knew that our really brilliant science uh, uh, engineers they're all musicians and artists, and that, that's how we got what we got. He said, that's why we succeeded. <coughs> Walter Isaacson has written books on the last three of those. Um, he, he wrote one on, on Benjamin Franklin, on Edison, and of course the book, book Steve Jobs. We think there is, exactly like Kay said, we think there's something profound with the sciences and the arts and all disciplines, multidisciplinary approach to education. We think lifespan. We think everyone being involved, every sector. And if you want to see collaboration, come visit us and you can see kind of how it started. And we hope that it does reach our vision of transforming Elkhart County through education, the single most biggest investment we'll make, and uh, that we would actually be a world-class place. Now, my phone says that I've gone for 15 minutes. And I think the goal was 12 to 15 minutes. So I'm at the outer edge of that. We might have time for just a few questions. I think we don't this round. <laughs> <laughs> See you a little later. <laughs> Brian will be here at lunch if you want to ask some questions other than that. All right, our next uh, speaker is from Kosciuszko County, Brad Bishop. Brad, you want to start making your way down here? Joined OrthoWorks as executive director in June of 2010, bringing with him more than 20 years of orthopedic injury industry experience. Prior to joining OrthoWorks, Brad served as director of public affairs at Zimmer Inc., where he was responsible for internal and external communications, corporate philanthropy, community affairs, state and local government relations. Wow, a lot of activity. He serves as treasurer of Zimmer's Political Action Committee. He had joined Zimmer in 88 and has served in a variety of public affairs and communications roles for Zimmer and its former parent company, Bristol Myers Strip. In addition to his industry experience, Brad has served on a number of associations and civic boards, including the Indiana Health Industry Forum, Kosciuszko Development Inc., the YMCA of Kosciuszko County, the Kosciuszko County Visitors Bureau, the Orthopedic Capital Foundation, and the Kosciuszko Community Foundation, where he served as board president. He's also past president of the Board of Directors of the United Way of Kosciuszko County. He was recently appointed by Governor Mike Pence to chair the Indiana Regional Works Council for the North Central Region.
Brad is also a graduate of Ball State University. Please join me in welcome, Brad Bishop. Thank you, Tim, and, uh, and, and thank all of you for uh, being here today. In that uh, excessive uh, bio that Tim read, you'll notice, you, you notice there were no science or education credentials, so who better than me to be uh, chief uh, advocate for uh, science and education in, in our region? Um, and that was sarcasm. I don't know if you science education people do sarcasm. That's so, sort of what that was. Um, Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, you know, I think um, Dr. Bertram said so, something interesting earlier and, and uh, about STEM being about jobs, jobs, jobs. And I know that raises the uh, hackles of some people in, uh, in education land, particularly in academia, because it's not learning for learning's sake and the joy of learning and all of that sort of thing. And maybe some of you will, are young enough to, you'll see that cycle back around right now. But if you see all the uh, the attention in these circles, it's all on STEM and career technical education, particularly in Indiana, where we do have a, a major manufacturing base. So I'm going to talk to you from an employer's perspective. Um, you know, our organization represents um, the orthopedic industry cluster in Warsaw, so that's sort of the, the, uh, uh, the, um, which one? the perspective I'll be sharing with you. Uh, I want to just uh, a little bit of a uh, primer on the orthopedic industry. These are the things that are made by the companies based in Warsaw and around Kosciuszko County and elsewhere. Uh, the two largest categories are hip and knee replacements uh, because we're all getting old and falling apart and uh, people need lots of those. Um, shoulder replacements are becoming more common. And then there's a whole blizzard of things in the trauma, fracture, fixation, uh, spinal repair area that the companies uh, also do. Um, the reason that's important to us is that uh, in Kosciuszko County, about 7,000 people are directly employed in, uh, in orthopedic manufacturing companies, and economists tell me that uh, tell us that there's another 6,000 or so uh, that have jobs because those other 7,000 people aren't there working in orthopedics. So that represents about 43% of uh, county employment, and. Uh, so the industry in a, in a community that's had it pretty good for a long, long time. Uh, Depew was the first orthopedic, uh, modern orthopedic company it was founded in 1895, and uh, the industry's perked along pretty well ever since then. Wars didn't slow it down. The last recession did, to some degree, uh, but uh, you know not to the extent that it had on other industries. Uh, a few years ago, some uh, industry leaders and others started to think, you know. Maybe we shouldn't take this for granted, which led to the creation of OrthoWorks uh, with funding by, uh, primarily from the Lilly Endowment, which has funded a few other examples of community-based organizations that are built around uh, industry clusters with the notion that um, lots change in 100 years. If communities don't do the right things to keep those businesses and jobs there, then they won't uh, throw off the community and. Uh, and social benefits that they do. So that's uh, so that's why we were formed. Uh, the companies here, this is a map of sort of the impact of uh, different places in, in the United States on orthopedic medical devices. The companies in Warsaw generate now over $12 billion of annual revenue, account for about half of the country's uh, hip and knee replacement business and about a third of the total. Another reason to pay attention to the industry is that the medical device jobs pay better than the average jobs. Uh, when we were formed in 2009, uh, about $10,000 better than the average uh, manufacturing job in Indiana. So these are all the reasons why uh, Lillian Allen and others came together to fund the creation of an organization with these members uh, that you see here um, on the list to, to work on sort of the issues that are at the inter intersection of the industry's interests and communities and education and talent development to, is uh, one of the principal ones. Here's the list of the things. In addition to my vast experience over two years in education circles, I'm, in, I'm an expert in these other things, having uh, uh, dealt with them for a couple of years now. So um, we are actually an organization of six people uh, that, that work in those initiative areas. 
uh, education has been one of our principal focuses. Uh, you know, the orthopedic industry is highly complex, global, uh, engineering driven, uh, advanced manufacturing is, uh, is uh, you know, really kind of lifeblood of the jobs in our county. Um, they are um, themselves highly advanced and technological. There are very few unskilled or low-skilled positions in the orthopedic industry. So most of our jobs are in that new category called middle skill, um, which is people that have certificates or associates, um, uh, that kind of thing, as well as, then we have, of course, all the way up to uh, PhD scientists, engineers, uh, people like that. So um, we have participated in STEM, uh, primarily in the Warsaw School Corporation, although we're now moving out. Uh, we funded uh, uh, the first you know, part of the first standalone, standalone STEM Academy in Warsaw. Um, they converted one elementary school to a standalone uh, STEM school. And uh, more recently, uh, we funded the uh, Moving STEM Forward program, which is uh, intends to drive uh, STEM not just in project-based learning, not just in that one school, but uh, in all eight elementary schools in the corporation. And um, you know, we've picked. Uh, certain uh, interesting ideas from other places. The Ethos bus is now uh, being uh, rep replicated in our area, the mobile STEM uh, laboratory. And we're also funding a STEM mentor position from orthopedics. I think this is the toughest part for uh, employers and for educators is making connection between, well, what does, what do, what does industry really want and what can educators provide? Because we also live in our own uh, worlds talk different languages and, and really have trouble getting on the same page because we're all so busy doing what it is we do. So, you know, organizations like us can kind of help bridge that gap. If your community doesn't, you know, be, I think it'd behoove you to try to start identifying people who can, who can sort of uh, live a little bit with one uh, uh, foot in each world. We're excited about being able to support the Project Lead the Way Partnership. Our organization is providing most of the funding in Kosciuszko County for the, the, the local match. Uh, the community foundations also participating. Uh, education and workforce issues graded out the highest amongst their uh, uh, donors' preferences, so they're making a proactive grant as well. So um, it's really exciting because uh, for us, Project Lead the Way or Project Based Learning in general uh, really, uh, really hits at both the middle skill, skill position. People are going to work in a factory, an enormous, an incredibly advanced factory that you can eat off the floor in, but they're going to work in a factory. Uh, so we need lots of those people right now and in the future. And of course, do the pipeline of talent for those kids who are interested in staying in the region and going in, in a, you know, onto college, uh, project lead the way, and prepare them for engineering and, and other jobs. And hopefully, it might engineers more fun to hang around with because now they've had to interact with uh, others and communicate and things like that that they don't have to worry about uh, when the current generation of engineers are being trained. Apologies to all the engineers in the room. Um, we're also working with uh, Cell in Indianapolis uh, uh, on an even grant with uh, Work One and Ivy Tech and others uh, to uh, work on remediation issues and career technical pathways. So there's a lot of energy uh, across the state and in our region in particular on uh, this whole notion of career technical education and STEM, which to me are uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, also, as I mentioned, our efforts in, in the Regional Works Council, and I think that's, you know, that's complementary to this whole notion of what are the pathways that we can build um, to help kid, get the kids exposed to careers and then get them on a track that will lead them to that. Um, we've done some other things, as I said, you know, the middle school or advanced manufacturing job, middle school, uh, really important to us. And we have a, a, Warsaw has its own Ivy Tech location and they have a standalone uh, training center where they work for the Orthopedic Advanced Manufacturing Training Center. And, and this is a great example of how education and the industry don't always communicate particularly well, because when we came into being, um, most of our members didn't know that that training center existed although it had been created specifically for them. And it was just a matter of uh, Ivy Tech hadn't gotten the right input from the right people. They'd send people like me to meetings. 
And I was a journalist major, I can't really tell them much about how to program CNC machines or you know, what the uh, requirements are, but we, through our ability to bring people, the right people to the table, we made a lot of progress there, and uh, now that's you know, a, real, a real jewel for our, uh, for our community. Uh, we've done some things on uh, professional uh, uh, career advancement as well, um, regulatory affairs or regulatory compliance for medical devices is an increasingly confusing and complex uh, uh, field that varies by country. Um, so we, with Grace College, we created a, a program for uh, graduate regulatory and clinical affairs. We just launched one in uh, quality device, in medical device quality management. So those are things that are really uh, critical to that industry. Um, we have a big uh, push for university engagement. Um, this is probably you know, the greatest example of where you know, two parties don't understand each other. You would think in an engineering scientific field like uh, orthopedics that um, you know, those firms would have great relationships with Indiana, uh, Indiana schools, the School of Medicine, Purdue, Rose Holman, and Notre Dame in engineering. And for the most part, for the most part with some uh, sort of sporadic occasions, examples, uh, that's not been the case. Uh, those academic relationships have been formed with schools outside of Indiana, so we'd like to, uh, we'd like to change that and uh, have a big engagement effort going on uh, at this point. So I think that's it. I appreciate the opportunity to just to describe for you from an employer's perspective how we view STEM. Absolutely critical to our industry. Um, another sort of thing that I hear from people in government and academia is that the, the companies need to do more to engage, and I, while I would say that's true, um, the rest of the world is competing for these jobs and they're willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that there are trained workforces in whatever that location is. So it really is incumbent upon all of us, the companies for sure, but us as communities and, and to support you as educators and, and helping prepare the, the workforce of the future for these industries. So thanks a lot. Brad. Our last presenter here in this section, Jeff Ray, our president and CEO of St. Joseph's County Chamber of Commerce. Jeff is probably known to a, a lot of you here in the room, but I think it's important to give his due here and read his bio for you. Jeff is currently the president and CEO of St. Joseph's County Chamber of Commerce, a role that he has held since September of 2010. In his position, Ray represents the interests of more than 1,100 member businesses, constituting over 85,000 employees in our area. Ray guides the Chamber's efforts in their three strategic areas of focus, economic development, public policy, and education. He has led the 2012 creation of the Chamber's Grow SJC Economic Development Program and its Grow SJC program serving as the lead economic development organization of St. Joe County. Prior to coming to the Chamber, Jay served, Jay, the, Jeff served as uh, mayor of the city of Mishawaka for six and a half years. Ray comes from a family of small business owners, owning the Tribal Ray Drugstore in Mishawaka for 53 years and the Cumberland Pharmacy in Bourbon, Indiana for 55 years. It is there where Ray learned about a very young age the value of education, business, and its importance, its importance to the su success of the local economy. Jeff Ray, please come on up. Hey, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I will, uh, I'm going to debate Brad for a second because I might be less qualified to uh, speak about science even than, than Brad is. Although I have uh, uh, 10 people in my immediate family that majored in some sort of science career, which is, uh, as you know, is kind of the equivalent of staying at a Holiday Inn Express uh, uh, last night. So uh, anyway, let me talk for just a quick second, though, uh, uh, just about the, uh, the community impact. One more. Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, just talk about a little bit what's happening in St. Joseph County, give you some real world um, experiences uh, related to what we're seeing on the STEM side of things. You know, we, uh, it's something that, uh, that we care on a couple levels, and I'm going to uh, use the second to talk about. Personally, this is my daughter. My daughter is a sixth grader at LaSalle Academy here in, uh, in South Bend. And uh, she's working right here on her engineering fair uh, pr uh, project. And uh, as most students were, she was absolutely thrilled. Uh, doing this. Uh, no, not really, actually. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we put the, we gathered a whole bunch of materials, we put them on the counter, we uh, have gone through this process, or the project, we're wondering why 
Mr. Azar, Ms. Scott thinks that this is a good idea for her to do this. She's got a, a, a tremendous grade point average. She says good progress reports, but this is something that's really different for her, and she doesn't like it. In fact, the first uh, few minutes into this, she's building her prototype, and she throws it all down on the counter and goes stomping into the other room, and she says, this is stupid. I don't want to be an engineer anyway, so why do I have to do this? Uh, she wants to uh, open up a book and read the book and, uh, and uh, memorize whatever's in that book and, and such. And this was at the beginning. And so, well, she's moved uh, from the early stages of, of uh, being frustrated and thinking that she doesn't want to be an engineer to the later stages of thinking, this is a pretty cool way to learn. And, uh, and so uh, I've seen her since then be involved in several different projects. Uh, uh, she had built some sort of lunar landing module that uh, has uh, marshmallows in it that uh, she's dropping. And, about five nights in a row I come home and she's built a different prototype every night as she's working on, on fine tuning. So I'm really excited about the good work that you are doing, each of you in the schools that you're working in. You have a, the incredible task of educating kids for jobs that in some cases don't exist today. So an, an awesome responsibility that you have here. Our hope is as a business community uh, that we're here to help you too. And, we're, and we want that uh, relationship to be very close and we like to articulate those needs. Why? Because that from a community standpoint, uh, this, is, uh, this is quite a race. There are 8,000 plus uh, communities in the United States competing for the jobs that we're competing for uh, today. And each day we're trying to differentiate ourselves as a community and we're wondering if we can keep up with that competition. I'm going to share a couple examples uh, here in a minute uh, on, that, uh, on that competition. Um, I don't have to go through all the, the, the stats and stuff up there, but our employers today tell us consistently they cannot find the workers that they need. Uh, for the jobs. It's pretty an interesting thing from a community standpoint because I look at the unemployment list over here and there's about 15,000 people out of work looking for uh, some sort of job and then I go over here and there are thousands of, of uh, open jobs at, at companies uh, uh, that, that uh, companies just can't fill. So we, we wonder uh, how to uh, connect those dots, if you will, and we think the good work that you're doing in the schools is going to be one of those things that really prepares those for the opportunities in the future. We know as we look at where our target industries are in the, in the future that STEM education is absolutely critical for it. And if we have that right workforce, we're going to succeed and we're going to have some good um, success. All the studies, reports everywhere tell you that, uh, that STEM is, is where it's at and, 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 or that the, the, the future opportunities there and economic growth will follow that. And we have a number of industries, whether it be advanced manufacturing, whether it be uh, related to biomedical or whether it's uh, high-speed data and stuff, all that require those basic, those skills that you see in those STEM uh, curriculums. And, uh, and so as we prepare the community, and, and people ask us all the time, Brian actually did a good job, I think, of, of, of outlining some uh, uh, characteristics of Elkhart County. It's, it's not dissimilar in, uh, in St. Joseph County where we've struggled. We're behind where we'd like to be in terms of job and jobs and new development. So we've got to do those things we can to, uh, uh, to prepare our community for the future. Why does it matter if you're watching the news here locally? Uh, one, you saw uh, just in the news this week, MTI uh, down in the bottom right hand corner announced that they were sending a $1.3 million friction welder overseas. And uh, they're looking for STEM uh, people to, to build friction welders. And, uh, and, it's, and it's a consistent amongst existing companies as you've read about data reality or what's happening at the Union Station. Technology Center, or at companies like uh, uh, Damon Products or Federal Mogul, they're all looking for folks that have those STEM uh, type uh, foundations or backgrounds there. And you can make a pretty good living here in, in, in St. Joseph County. And heard many of those stories, in particular from people who, who didn't know anything about the opportunities until they took a job as a janitor in, the, in a factory, for example, and, and opened their eyes to a world. We're hoping to, that we can change that. We'd love to be your connection to the business community as you seek to get in and see some of those opportunities there. You know, it's interesting because I had to be on campus today. I had to think about, you know, what we're doing isn't much different than what Brian Kelly does, right? You know, uh, uh, Brian Kelly's trying to build a program here at Notre Dame. He's trying to attract the top talent. He's trying to build the right uh, facilities. He's also trying to understand why he wins and why he loses games. And in fact, yesterday, if you were listening to Sports Talk, uh, uh, Brian Kelly's press conference yesterday, he was talking about punt returning. And it's something as, as simple as that, but those of you that are big fans of, uh, of Notre Dame football know that Notre Dame perhaps has the worst punt return team in the entire uh, college football. And it's been that way for, what, probably a decade at least, uh, though I can't remember the last time. Uh, maybe Rocket Ishmael, maybe his days here was probably the last time. Uh, so, so anyway, so Brian Kelly's looking at game film. He's understanding why he's losing games. 
and he's setting strategies to help him win games next time around. So, uh, it's interesting. So, when, as we're doing that, we're watching that game film. I got my team huddled up in the room, the big TV up there, looking at that game film, trying to understand it. And a couple factors that continue to weigh in on why we lose opportunities to other communities. One, uh, the cost of doing business, the ease of doing business, and the availability of talent. And I will say, those aren't necessarily in any order. Talent being the top um, decision maker uh, for most people to ask the question they're asking every time they're looking at an opportunity in our area. And it's interesting because cost used to mean how much is the land, how much does it cost me for a, a, a gallon of water, how much is, a, 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 is electricity, uh, that kind of stuff. Cost is, the biggest cost in most companies is labor. And, uh, and so what's it going to cost me now to get the labor trained to the to level I need? So really that talent piece is a, is a, is a key differentiator in, in so many things. So as we design strategy to try to change the trajectory of St. Joseph County and move it in a different direction than we've seen in recent years, we know, like Brian Kelly's got to do with his punt game, uh, is we've got to figure out how to, how to change the trajectory, and I think that's what we're trying to do. So let me give you a real-world real world example. A lot of things are, are interesting. You know, when we're talking about um, STEM, this is a really long-term proposition for us. In fact, it's hard for us sometimes to get our manufacturers excited about this or other companies because it is long-term. Uh, you were talking about educating kindergartners. It's a long time until those kids are ready in the workforce. I don't know if I'm going to be in business today, tomorrow, whatever. It's hard for me to wait that long. Still absolutely critical that we educate those. And I want to mention just a real-world opportunity here recently, and uh, actually a couple of This was one uh, that we got pretty excited about. Actually, this is a company that had decided on, uh, on three communities uh, in Indiana, and it had, had narrowed down to three finalists. And, uh, and we had a chance to really make a pitch, South Bend, Fort Wayne, and uh, Columbus, Indiana, foreign investment, uh, advanced manufacturing opportunity. We're seeing a lot of interest from overseas, in particular right now on advanced manufacturing opportunities. Uh, about 50 jobs, but that's pretty exciting to us. You know, we, we're not going to hit grand slams all the time, but that's a pretty significant uh, investment, about $14 million in new capital investment in those three, th three communities. So we got a chance to make our pitch with these, uh, uh, with these other two communities. And I'm pretty excited about um, how we stack up against that. In fact, I was sharing with them in particular the history of innovation uh, here in our community. If you go back all the way to the 1920s, it was Vincent Bendix and, and 5,500 patents uh, uh, that were created in South Bend from 1920 to 1930 for new product development they were doing. We were the leaders in the industry in advanced manufacturing in, aer in aerospace or automotive or something. So I'm talking about a great, uh, rich uh, history there. It's pretty funny, though. Those other two communities, they're kind of talking about what's going on today. And, uh, and, and uh, not that I don't have a great uh, you know, story about what's going on today, but it was, uh, it was an interesting thing. So it's interesting, so you know, if I was to, if it was nice to fast forward to, to where we are, uh, uh, we finished third. And uh, you know, in, 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 in most races, you'd know, like to be in the top three, right? I'd have got bronze medal if I was over in Sochi at the Olympics, right? But there are no, uh, no awards for, uh, uh, for finishing third. And, and, uh, and, and you know, the, the bottom line is much like Brian Kelly, when he loses a game on Saturday, he's got to figure out how to win the game uh, next time. And so it's interesting. We ultimately lost this to Columbus, Indiana. And I just want to share a couple examples of Columbus if you're not familiar. Columbus, for, for, to put in perspective for you if, you don't, if you're not familiar with it, is smaller than Mishawaka. Uh, so doesn't have a major, and not trying to minimize Columbus, because I'm going to say good things about it here and stuff, but, but it's, it's uh, south of Indianapolis. It's a great, great community. Uh, a lot of wonderful things going on there. And it was interesting, because the, the primary reason that we lost to a community like Columbus was because of the pipeline of students that they had there, in particular in the STEM-related fields. And Columbus, in particular, is one of the, I think, the shining examples in Indiana of a community that's put all the right pieces together to really help development happen down there and stuff. So if you, and, and not to you know, belabor the details, but Columbus in particular has, uh, you know, the project-based learning, the magnet school there, the manufacturing technology school, New Tech High School, so really a whole uh, collaborative effort of, uh, of building that pipeline. And much like, uh, I think it was Brian was, was sort of laying out that pipeline uh, uh, for workers, uh, Columbus had done a phenomenal job on, on doing something like that. And Columbus is, uh, you know, for a, pretty, uh, for a small city, um, ranks a pretty high on a lot of stuff. It's leading the nation in, in job growth. It's the uh, um, it's, uh, best place to live. A lot of different things like that. But it's really interesting because when I look at Columbus, in fact, we had a speaker uh, in this week uh, sort of sharing uh, some of the stories from down there. I thought, boy, we sure have got a great recipe 
for success here as well. And it's just uh, up to us to really harness that and move that in the right direction. And I think that we could do some of those things, learning those lessons. Actually, Fort Wayne has done some fantastic things too. You know, it's interesting because it, when, uh, uh, when I assess what people look at when they're looking at this area, um, they feel like uh, our, our picture is a little bit more like the one on the left. That, uh, that, we, that, that you know, when I tell them about Notre Dame and the things that are happening here, that, that we really have a strong higher ed system, that, you know, that the career in tech and that, that, the, that balancing this on the K-12. And that's not for, meant to be any criticism of anything that's going on because I really think there's some fantastic things and I've been, my eyes have been open to many of the different things that are happening there. But a company's perception uh, on that pipeline in particular has them worried if, if there are enough programs going on in the K-12 through system to help move in that right direction. Our hope is that a project like Project Lead the Way helps us build that stronger foundation that's not uh, liable to tip over uh, one way or the other uh, with a really a stronger K through 12. And that's what's got us, the business leaders in this community excited. It's why they came together to help raise the dollars necessary to make sure that we can implement this in every school that wants to implement this program. So we're really excited about that opportunity. You know, it's interesting because I mentioned the, 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 the opportunity, the Columbus, just this week, two other opportunities, this, kind of the same conversation. Now, we haven't finished third yet, um, still in the mix, uh, but Thursday we had a distribution uh, logistics opportunity out of the West Coast uh, that already has a facility in our community. And so it's pretty exciting when they're already here because they know a little bit about us, but it, that can work uh, for or against us as well. In fact, uh, uh, the CEO who was in from the Boston area was, uh, was, is, is interesting in doing a half a million square foot facility here, but he's not sure because he's worried about the workforce, and, uh, we've, which has is, is inspired some good conversation with the company about things that we can do to help load that pipeline. In fact, we actually put the pressure on the company in particular to take some ownership in this as well. They've been in this community for an awful long time. They employ uh, uh, good wages and good benefits and those things. It's up to them to make sure though that they also are partnering with you and making sure your students know about the opportunities that are there. We hope to be your connection there and so if you're looking for those opportunities, connect, feel free to call us because we'd like, we like to connect you in there. Um, I'm just going to uh, wrap up. You know, uh, this is uh, very unique when I start thinking about the partnership that's, uh, that's been created here. And Sean uh, laid the foundation in the beginning, and under CPEG's leadership, really the economic development folks from across this region have, as Sean mentioned in his opening, have come together to, to talk about what are the things that help us uh, uh, grow our economy. And, it, and I think there's consensus among all of us that are working across this region that the project lead the way, partnership is really positive. If we can continue to build upon that, build on the other things that are happening in your schools too. We know uh, um, whether it's things like the STEM Academy that Kay mentioned or what's happening in the, with the career and technical education in, in the different schools. We also know that we hear great things from our employers who are already benefiting from Project Lead the Way students. We know that uh, what's happened in Mishawaka High School and in Riley and in Penn um, are all really positive things uh, in, in, from, that our employers have articulated to us too. And so they're excited about that pipeline. That's why we didn't have any trouble when we went to them and said, we need you to step up on, on this opportunity here. So, so, so you're gonna see a more engaged business community. We hope to play a, a role in that. We wanna be connected. We wanna support the things you're doing. We wanna make sure you understand the needs that, uh, that our companies have as you're preparing them for those jobs that don't exist today or are getting ready to, uh, to exist today too. So think of, think of, the, of this as, as, a, as a wonderful partnership. And, uh, and, and I think that in, in the end of the day, we're going to see some outstanding benefits uh, in St. Joseph County. We're going to really impact the whole region. You know, our, you know we're in St. Joe County uh, today, but there's about a million people that live in the nine counties uh, that surround us. And, uh, and it's interesting, when we, when we talk to economic development experts about where the job opportunities are in the future, it's in communities our size. People aren't, um, and, and not all people, but, but, I, but, but the communities like Chicago's and Los Angeles uh, of the world are gonna have a harder time, I think, attracting people. People don't wanna commute an hour and a half uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to school each day or to work uh, each day. I think people wanna live in, in communities that have uh, um, great quality of life and things like that. In, in our region, people describe it as a, as a little big town all the amenities of a, of a big town, but still sort of the uniqueness of, of a little town. So really everything you want to experience here 
we know that, uh, uh, that, that, a, that a cooperative effort amongst this region is going to help get us there, and that's why we're so excited about it. So thanks again for uh, the chance to spend just a minute with you today and, and sort of share our experiences at the time. So I'll turn back to you. I think that what, what, what we read, it's really interesting, I, and I used Columbus's presentation, for example, when we were competing against them because they were able to illustrate everything from the number of students in, in, enrolled in the Project Lead the Way launch program to the number of uh, kids in the STEM program to the number uh, doing the pre-engineering in Project Lead the Way to the number of students at Ivy Tech. Uh, doing a program, so I think a, a great point there. So we certainly will uh, uh, better illustrate that. I'm sure, both. Another question, comment. Gordon, I'll come back to you with a follow up. But I just wanted to let somebody else in. Gordon, would you? Do you want to follow up? Well, yes, I was just. Yeah. I, I, I was thinking in terms of the influence on the economy, the three parts maybe. see all of the economic uh, activity going on in the area. And I was wondering if there would be some way to present to them that these opportunities are there for them when they graduate college and they can come back. So we have that workforce available. Is there yep. some connection that uh, is there already that I don't know about or something that we can grow? Right, so a, a couple things we're trying to do. One, in terms of bringing students back, we've started our intern uh, program where we want to, especially in that college uh, uh, age, uh, those that went away to school somewhere else will bring them back. So you, you through the IndianaIntern.net, can connect uh, with opportunities on local employers. So we're out shaking the bushes with local employers, asking them to make sure students know about those opportunities so that we attract that talent back. Then we'll do a number of programs throughout the course of the summer that help connect those here so they find that, you know maybe some of that glue that, that ultimately sticks here. We also want to work really hard, I think, on connecting into those business community. Business leaders have recognized they haven't played the active role they should have in opening their doors and making sure people see those opportunities. And so, so it's, it's, it, it's imperative and we'd love for, you know, the, the teacher at Riley doesn't necessarily know who to call sometimes. We'd love them to call us and for us to be able to say, you know what, X, Y, Z over on Sample Street's doing exactly what you're looking for. Let's get you in over there. I think business leaders are more committed than I've ever seen them before to coming into the classroom talking about those opportunities or opening up those doors to let students see those opportunities as well. And I think that real world practical piece is, is so important. So hopefully we're addressing that continuum of planting some seeds early on, but also giving them some real opportunities when they're seeking those opportunities. I use a, an example a lot of times when I'm talking of a, of a Penn High School student actually that went down to, to uh, IU came back seeking a summer opportunity here in our area and ended up washing dishes here. And you know what, washing dishes here, not that, it's, that you know, somebody's gotta wash the dishes, but what it told him about this area was there were no opportunities for him and that he should, when he was looking for a real job, consider that somewhere else. And so we're hoping that we, uh, we, we don't leave that impression on those students that obviously were very talented uh, uh, you know, throughout their academic career. We hope we bring them back. You know, this question is uh, addressed to Jeff and uh, Brad and maybe some of the other business leaders. So I know that in the partnership with Project Lead the Way, the local businesses have stepped up and put uh, matching funds together. And for Project Lead the Way, uh, if the way it's organ uh, the way the funding is organized, it's to grow new projects. But we have a number, like at Penn High School, at Riley, and other places, they're already established, and they're for new programs there that they could get money. But for their established programs, where they might still want to do some growing, uh, are you guys maybe thinking about? Because these are leaders in Project Lead the Way now, and they might be uh, more enthusiastic if they have some chance to grow outside the, the present uh, system. 
and I think that's absolutely on the mind of our, our business leaders, not, not to penalize, if you will, those early uh, adapters. In fact, a number of them, is, especially we mentioned, we're talking biomedical, for example, the hospitals, for example, are both big fans of that program and see that as being a pipeline to future workers. I think you'll see them uh, willing to do other things, not only to, to help those existing that have already implemented, but also to help with some of those ongoing costs. We recognize that this is a, that, that, that this isn't a one-time opportunity, and today, well, it, it may be a one-time opportunity, but, it, but, but today, the grant opportunities here, our hope is it sustains over a longer period of time. We don't want three years from now to be considering the next great STEM uh, alternative, because this one didn't get off like it needed to be. The business community is, is really committed to helping work individually even with each of those schools to help uh, continue that rollout. We've got uh, time, just about a, a minute left. Joe? Uh, it's, it's Joe Bellina again. Uh, uh, I wanted to respond to, to something that was asked a moment ago. There's an organization developing here in South Bend called the Oceana Science and Technology Center. and and a big part of our vision is to create that connection between the educational process and the business process. Try to find a way, use the, the organization to help students see what's going on in the community, technologically speaking, get them to see what's needed for them to be able to learn to do what they need to do. So that's really the focus of, this or, focus of the organization. It's just beginning, but I'd encourage any of you to you know, think about supporting it. Thank you, Joe. Quick question while I'm um, moving on to a few announcements here. Questions for folks in K-12 education here. How many of you expected that the Chamber of Commerce was interested in you giving them a call? I mean, it's a fair question. Anybody? It's not quite fair to take that as a no, because it's a public place. But, you know, I'd, I'd have been surprised, frankly. And I'd say that that's a little bit of a sign, right, of some, uh, uh, some room for growth in our community, right? And what we see here is, a, is an, awful lot of, of a, an awful lot of reaching out from the business community, and maybe we need some from the grassroots up, from the education community as well. Well, I would like to say that I think that there has been real movement over the last several years not only in this community, but in other communities, to know that this is a partnership. And that everything, you know, we all hear the, the words about it takes a village. And I think that the chamber um, just really is working hard to make sure that we all see ourselves as partners. And the whole idea of working together as business, as school corporations, instead of being um, not growing the same direction, in looking at us as a bigger community, and that's not just within the realm of South Bend, Mishawaka, Granger area, and not just within Indiana or within the other states, but the fact that we've all got to work cohesively together um, in order to help prepare our young men and women for what is to come. And I do feel that uh, we have um, been given the opportunities to start developing these powerful relationships and appreciate everything uh, that the Chamber does here. 